Welcome one, welcome all. I am Bridger and this is Axis Empires. Last episode we went through the first two seasons of the game, spring and summer of 1937. Now we are in autumn of 1937 and this episode will also conclude through winter and January, February of 1938. So, with that having been said, what's the state of the world? We have a fairly quiet, fairly normal thing going on in Europe. Nothing crazy or special going on there, but over in the Pacific, we are on the precipice of war. I did make two errors in the previous video that I caught after the fact, and I have corrected both of them. Number one is I had the Allies accidentally playing a second rearmament card in 1937. That's illegal. They can only play one per turn, so I have fixed that. They are playing open door policy instead in the hopes of creating a Chinese incident since they failed to get the two uh, Chinese powers on the same page. Right now, they are still separated. If Japan goes to war with one of them, then they will not be going to war with the other one. And China's Ch Chinese uh, player obviously doesn't like that. The Allies would prefer to have them both go to war at the same time. So this card is specifically designed for that. It says the status quo continues in Asia and the Pacific, but more importantly, uh, they're trying to get Chinese incident to happen, assuming that the Axis are going to be playing a demand card here. So that is what's going on. And we will now begin with the German player turn over in Europe. Uh, first, we will discard, send back to hand, send back to hand, and then discard, discard, discard. Bingo. Now we're ready to go. German rearmament. Super boring. We're going to remo remove one Ribbentrop Diplomacy or Demand card, and then we're going to remove one Production Directorate. So we're going to get rid of Gal Mosseland, and then we're going to get rid of... I mean, listen, atomic bombs in German hands, that's the dream, but it just has such a low chance of success compared to these other ones. It's tough to say, I'm going to hold this all the way to the end of the game and then roll on it and miss multiple times. Uh, so I'm going to say no to atomic bombs this time. We've got the Manhattan Project. Don't worry. There'll be, there'll be some things going on. So that's done. Now we just have to add these things to the force pool. Uh, so we'll pull up the... There it is. And this is card two. So we just send all this to the force pool. Boom. And then Germany gets to build one armor and one infantry step. And they've got the armor in Breslau and an infantry step here in Berlin. And everything else is in the force pool. Perfect. Now, what is their next card, however? We know it's military purges. It's boring. The first year of German card play is fairly straightforward. There's only really one card you can play around with, and that's the summer card. And now we're ready for the Axis card. Uh, so... I have also given myself the liberty of adjusting some of the movements from the previous thing because I try to keep this moving fast for you guys. I don't want to sit here staring and studying the map and trying to figure out what the most optimal thing to do is. So I have uh, given myself a mulligan to go and uh, readjust things. If I had been doing that staring, then I would have figured it out uh, sooner. But this is the current situation. Demand Hainan is the card. We are demanding the island of Hainan down here. And if the Chinese give it to us, there will not be war. If they don't, there will be war. Why is the why is the island of Hainan important? It really isn't actually not important. It could be another Japanese base. Uh, it could be a way for the Japanese to get into China later, but for all intents and purposes, it's not important. This is a means to an end. We're trying to get to a war here if possible. And in the meantime, we need to play our next card, which is going to be Diplomatic Overtures. We don't have anything planned yet for Japan. Uh, once we figure out whether the war is beginning or not, then we will go to war. So this will be our pending card. Then we'll figure out the, the next uh, steps. So we've got our pending card. We've got two steps for the uh, Axis that need to come onto the map. We have a bunch of these going on here from the previous thing. So two steps. We're going to put them in Kyushu at the moment. All right. So now, if we do go to war, we're going to try to take Nanking early. Don't have super good odds. We did try to lure them north and try to keep them up here by keeping at least one Japanese step up here. A couple, two steps, actually, in the hopes that they expected us to blast through Hopei. In that case, that's the time when the 
nationalists really want to hold this river line. Unfortunately, they did sort of see us building up here a couple turns early and were able to reinforce Nanking. So Nanking currently has four, which means we need eight offensive factors to get a two to one. And two, four, seven, we will be able to get one more in place in time for this. So let's hope that works if we are, in fact, going to go to war. If Hainan belongs to Kyungsu and Nationalist China is a pack, meaning they are non belligerent, then select Kyungsu and roll one die. A three to a two is the war has begun. Remember, we're always minus one, uh, uh, minus one political DRM to these rolls because currently the victory point marker is on the Allied Crusade side. So the Allies have one VP at the moment, start of the game, that's how it works. And as soon as it goes to zero, which is going to happen the first time I capture one of these green or red hexes, then there will be no political DRM, which is more beneficial to me than the current situation. But the way that the war starts is we end nationalist China's policy and limited war is now in effect, and I receive a blitz marker. So we will end nationalist China's policy, uh, which was acceptance, and it's gone. Now, let's do a quick check here. We still have the Navy in charge of the government. That's a problem for us, because when we place our blitz marker on Nanking, it's going to cause us to roll on the cabinet crisis table. We're hoping it's not going to be too bad, but there's pretty much nothing good on that table for us. Let's see how it works. Uh, so we're now in the administrative phase, support segment, blitz marker placement. We're going to grab the blitz marker and we're going to place it on Nanking and hope for the best. Blitz marker has two benefits. Number one, it will activate a bunch of units to attack in the blitz phase. And during that blitz phase, a bunch of units have the ability to add extra combat shifts, including armor and airborne units. We don't have any armor and airborne units, but it does allow us to attack twice. So that's the main reason to do that. Um, you know, I wonder if we can get around this rule. Hold on, let me look something up. Oh yeah, that's right. We found a loophole. The Navy only cares if the blitz marker is placed in a land hex, but the blitz marker has a two hex range. I can place the blitz marker in any hex on the map. Uh, I do not have to place it on a land hex for this to work. So uh, placing it in Nanking would be beneficial insofar as I would turn Nanking into an open city, but placing it right here would still allow me to attack without rolling on the crisis table. So the Navy is just happy that we're doing some attacks around the coast. If we go too far inland, that's when the Navy's going to get mad. So that's the plan. We'll put the blitz marker there to avoid the crisis roll. We don't get the benefit of, you know, forcing them out of Nanking with, uh, with retreats, but we will hopefully be able to do a couple step losses, which will make follow-up attacks considerably easier. That having been said, we're now done with the blitz marker placement. We don't have any combinations to play, I don't think. These are already maxed out here, uh, and we obviously don't want to put any combinations here. We are going to move this guy. Now that the ruse is over and we're not threatening an attack on Hopei anymore, this guy is going to move back is he overstacked there? He is. So they're going to have to move and swap over to there. Okay, so next turn he'll move here. Uh, sorry, in the reserve, reserve movement he'll move here, and then he can break down next turn, grab to a port, and then ship himself in over here. Now we are on the operational movement phase. Uh, Formosa is definitely going to move here. Uh, oh, actually, in the detachment phase, I think we're going to put a detachment on Shanghai to make it easier for future maneuvers. So we're going to flip this guy over and hide him at the bottom of the Shanghai stack. Uh, detachments help hold areas that are otherwise Japanese dependents, right? Home islands always are open ports. These are staffed by Japanese forces, and we can always use them to move units to and from. But dependents like Iwo Jima, like Okinawa, like Formosa, like Marcus Island, like Korea... They do not have permanent garrisons. We have to put one there uh, if there isn't one on the board. So that is going to mean that even if we move out of uh, Shanghai, it still counts as a Japanese open port. So that's that's the plan there. Now, um, I think we're going to move 
some of these units down here and probably two of these units down here. And then we're going to move this guy using up the troop convoy for the operational move. So now we have the eight factors we need to go after them. We have five here and three offensive factors here. And we're going to be able to attack that in blitz combat. And then we're going to be able to attack it again in regular combat. And we have one axis luck marker to re-roll the roll if we absolutely have to be. So it is eight to four, which gives us a six. Two to one, six, attacker defeated, not okay. Send that luck marker to the delay box. And before I forget, roll for shipbuilding. Here's uh, Germany shipbuilding needs a one. They didn't get it. Japan needs a one, two, or a three. Didn't get it. All right, now we're doing the re-roll on that blitz roll. Not a six. Come on, how about a three or a two or a one? Excellent. The allies would definitely re-roll this, but they're sadly... For them, their marker is uh, still right here on the next turn. They used it earlier to try to mess with something else. So the Axis got extra lucky on a 2-1 to one reduced to a 3-2 to two because of the, uh, the city. And by the way, uh, we are attacking across a straight here. However, the fact that we are also attacking across a regular land hex means that we can ignore the straight penalty. You always take the hex side penalty that is the lowest. And so this is the lowest penalty as a nothing if you attack across a regular hex side. If we were attacking across a strait and a river, the river penalty is lower. That's what we'd take. But in this case, the only shift is for the city. So that gets us to, uh, what do we say? It was a one on the three to two column, which is a DR1, which means the defenders have to take one step loss. If they take the step loss on the big unit, they'll lose two factors. So they're going to take the step loss on the garrison instead. Now that's going to remove their sort of inherent non-retreatability, non but they can still use the city itself uh, as the ability to uh, what's called a voluntary retreat conversion. So that's the end of blitz combat. We're going to do regular combat. And this time we are eight to three, which doesn't change the math at all, unfortunately. Uh, but it would if we had one more step. Damn it. Um, so we're rolling again, this time without a re-roll. Cross your fingers. It's a four on the three to two column. That's an exchange, just barely good enough for the Japanese. They got lucky there. So the exchange means that that unit has to take a step loss and also the J Japanese unit has to take a step loss. Let's see which one wants to take the step loss. Probably this guy here is going to go back to the force pool. All right. Unfortunately, we did not take Nanking. But we did significantly reduce it here for Japan. So uh, they are feeling much better about the situation than they were before when this was a pretty big gamble. Although having the luck marker and the allies not having the luck marker did give them a bit of an edge, which they desperately needed in order to make this work. So that having been said, I think that means that we're done with the Japanese except for a reserve movement, which is going to be this unit probably moving to Formosa. Yeah, troop convoy during reserve movement is going to move him to Formosa. Can't move directly into Fuchao because there is that is inside an enemy Zok. Can't move into Shanghai because that is in an enemy Zok. Um, boy, leaving that one in Shanghai is actually kind of dangerous, but this guy's not going to attack out of Dan King. I don't have to worry about that. He, if he fails, he gets an AD. He's going to have to fall back here or kill himself. So there's no way the allied player does that. Okay, I think that's it for Japan, um, except... During the conditional event segment, they have to send these units to the delay box. Delay box, delay box. And this doesn't have a delay box, so we have to pull that back up and move it over there manually. There we go. Okay. So, delay box it is. Now we're on to the British over on this map. What did they have in mind? They had British rearmament. Boring. I'm just going to go ahead and take care of this. All right, so the British gained their surface fleet, their convoy, six armor steps, and a special uh, British Expeditionary Unit, uh, BEF, British, British Expeditionary Force, uh, and then they are done, except they do have to choose a card. And for them, uh, we have, I believe, Chamberlain Diplomacy is going to go in this slot here. So that's what's going next. Let's send that to their pending card. Bada bing, bada boom. We're heading over to the uh, allies over here. Um, 
so the allies over here are now in a bit of a bind. They know that China is in a good deal of trouble. So because nationalist China is in trouble, the Americans are going to play a series of cards to help them help the nationalist Chinese. So starting with quarantine address, I've got that stacked on top of something else here by mistake. There we go. Quarantine address is, let's see, it allows them to get some colonialism and maybe cabinet crisis table. Boy, howdy, the Japanese don't like having a role in the cabinet crisis table. But, you know, that's what you get for having a cabinet in crisis all the dang time. So they are going to pick that as their pending card. And then U.S. aid to China is somewhere around here. That's the one we need next. There it is. Uh, so we're going to move that over this direction and put that next year because we're picking that winter card right now. After that, they probably want to play League of Nations because that will give them a nationalist Chinese step every turn of the summer. And that's one of the only cards that gives them nationalist Chinese steps. And this is actually part of the Axis plan here. The sneaky little realization that the Japanese player had is if he can convince the allied player to play League of Nations, it's a rearmament card. It will prevent the allied player from playing Commonwealth rearmament until the following year. Guess where the only British surface fleet is on this entire map? It's right here. Well, there might be another one very late on, but this is where they get their first surface fleet. The British do not start with a surface fleet, and they don't get one during the outbreak of war. They only get these uh, nationalist Chinese ones here. And uh, even the British Far East forces, they only get an HQ and then an Air Force, no fleet. So they'll either need to get a fleet sent over from Europe, which can take some time, or they will need to get that one off of card number, uh, what do we just look at, three. Because you can see this is their only option there. The other part of the Japanese plan we'll talk about when we get to Japan next. All right, so that's the situation. Uh, the Oops, I've got two here. Fix this. Right now, the Allies are playing open door policy because they anticipated that the Japanese were going to get one of the ceded land markers, and that didn't happen. So unfortunately, pre-war is not in effect. Japan doesn't have any seated landmarkers, so there's not going to be any Chinese incident. So the allied player effectively has a card that doesn't do anything. Uh, that was all part of Japan's master plan. <laughs> well, we'll see how well that actually works, uh, especially when Gandhi gets arrested. So that's the end of the Western Allies. Let's head over to the Soviets in Europe. They are playing Political Purges, and that is a card that has to discard a bunch of stuff. Let's take care of that. There we go. We've discarded all of these diplomatic cards because the version of Stalin we're playing is the historical one who thought, I can do everything myself. We'll just turn everything into Russian, and then we have full control over it. Meanwhile, they do have a plan for the winter. It's called a new five-year plan. That goes into their pending. And now we are ready. They don't get any steps here, so we're just skipping over the rest of that turn. We're going to the, 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 the Far East here. And the Far Eastern Russians have border disputes, which only does something if Russia's posture is at war. Yes, they are probably going to need to play these cards that do nothing back and forth here on the Eastern Front a lot, unfortunately, for them. Uh, and that means border dis defense is going to be their next card. They could play any of these cards, but these are much better in the summer. So they're going to wait until the summer to play them. Um, so that's going to make that a pending card. They can't play any of these war progress cards because those represent the war progress of the European total war. And the European total war has not begun yet. They can't play this because they have to play forces for the Far East at the same time. They can't play most of these other black cards. Ch Communist Chinese surrender can't play Chinese insurgency, though they'll want to play that eventually if the Communist Chinese join the war. They can't play Chinese ultimatum because the Japanese are not at Axis tied. They cannot... Can they play aid to China? They can play aid to China eventually. It has to go after pact with China. So they're going to play that after them to send aid to nationalist China. And nationalist China might build multiple steps a turn, and that's just going to be a ginormous headache for Japan.
they just build so many more steps than Japan does. And it, it, they, Japan has to basically keep on them and just keep squishing them because if they ever wait, then they get too dang big. All right, so we'll see how well that goes. That's the end of that. Let's go ahead and do some delay rolls and then we'll be done with this turn. I just realized we did not roll four shipyards for the allies at all. So let's do that. Here's the British. They need a five or less. They got it. The French, the Americans. So the Americans needed a one to three. They didn't get it. So the British can build the Prince of Wales. And then the Russians get to try their hand. Nope, they needed a one. They didn't get it either. So the Prince of Wales is a battleship. So it gets nine plus two plus a die roll. So 11 plus one is a 12. Okay, so four, eight, 12. It comes to August, September of 1940. The Prince of Wales will be out on the board. Unfortunately, it's not going to have a Bismarck to fight at the moment. So how did those uh, delay rolls go? Well, <laughs> The Japanese could not have been happier getting the air forces back next turn. The surface fleet is here. Uh, the CV fleet is over here. So they are in quite a good shape uh, going into this. Certainly, uh, I would be happy with this if I was playing as them. So let's jump over to turn number two of the, uh, of the fall. Axis marker goes here. These go to the force pool. This goes to the strategic warfare box. So the, unfortunately, the allies now have a lock marker and the axis do not. Um, oh, and I did forget one thing. The allies get their uh, outbreak of war cards, uh, cards, units. So this has to go to the delay box and this also has to go to the delay box. But for some reason, it's always hard to get it over here. There we go. So... Let's roll for these two real quick. Ooh, a six and a five. Japan could not get more lucky. One, two, three, four, five, six, all the way over here. No, no, no. It's one short um, because of, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. And then this is a five, so that goes there. All right. Well, I can't say that is bad. Except for the allies. <laughs> I, I actually, I, my point of view is usually from the side that's got the initiative, right? So in the early part of the game, my point of view will be sort of from the German side. And then eventually I'll be like from the point of view of the other side that's trying to push forward. Uh, that's how I kind of absorb things. So uh, turn two, German rearmament. We got nothing going on here. Uh, we got nothing going on with the British. We got nothing going on over here. So we don't even have to look at Europe. Uh, but over here, we definitely have something going on with Japan. What are they going to do now? Oh, uh, we missed the reserve movement was bringing this guy over here last turn. And now this guy can break down and bring out another one stepper to go with him. And then we can decide how we want to proceed here. I think we're going to start during the detachment phase. We're going to put a detachment here in Fuchao. And that will allow us to move this guy here. And on a future turn, then we can combine those two guys and they can leave potentially without having to worry about the port falling back into enemy hands. The blitz marker's gone, by the way. And now we've got a situation where we definitely want to attack Nanking this turn. Unfortunately, we can't bring any other units over unless. Unless, instead of moving this guy, we move this guy here. Now we've got five, six, seven, eight to one. Nope, doesn't make a difference. A seven to one and an eight to one are the same. So we're going to have that guy stay down there. All right, so that's going to be, and you know what? I think we want these guys to move here. Uh, do we want both of them? No, we want to maintain the supply route uh, here, probably. All right, so now we've got a combat here at, what do we say, seven to one. And seven to one is on this column here, but we get a shift for the city. So now it's on four to one, five to one. The allies have a reroll. If it goes really badly, they might try and use it. A three on a four to one, five to one is a DR101. Let's see, are the allies going to reroll that? What are the cards that we currently have? No, there's not going to be any political roles. Honestly, things could not get that much better for the allies. They could they could hope to maybe kill one Japanese step, but on a 4 to 1 5 to 1, they're going to get kicked out. So, that's what's going to happen. And the Japanese are going to take Nanking. Couple of really lucky rolls there. 
Um, I didn't even use their Air Force, actually, because uh, this unit gets simply force pool. Now, do we want to... Let's double check here. I forgot that we do have the Air Force. Let's remember that. We also have the Logistics Marker, but I didn't put it out because this is not a seasonal turn. And I've got the other Quang Tung Logistics Marker as well. And let's put all of these down here. These are not real support units. Uh, that's a convoy. It doesn't count. Okay. So now that that's the case, in reserve, these guys move to Darien, where they can be shuffled down here to help. And the allies are going to be next. Does Japan have any... These guys could move somewhere. One of them could move up here. Can't move into a Zoc during reserve movement. Um... And I don't know what the value of that is, but it gets them a little bit closer to something else. Either way, I think the Japanese are very happy with this. Things are going to start turning against them very quickly as soon as the quarantine address comes out. That's next turn. So now we'll go over to the Allies, the British. They have nothing to do over here, so we're skipping past them. And we're going over to the Americans over here. And this is where they do have a decision. How are they going to move this guy? Probably they want to go and get back to Wuhan. Unfortunately, they're not quite in position to do so. And they have to give up. This is a very good spot for them to help try to block reinforcements coming in this port. If Nanking hadn't fallen so fast, that unit would have been very uh, good to stay there. But as it is, they now have to try to fall back towards Wuhan and provide some defenses there. Unfortunately, the Allies don't have the ability to gain any units next turn, so maybe Japan can take Wuhan just like that. Now, these other cities will continue to spawn uh, enemies for a while, but until then, let's see what happens. The Japanese, the, 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 the Americans here are done, so let's head over to the Russians, and the Russian TK card has nothing. And the DS card has nothing. I don't think they have any moves to make. So we check and see if there are any delay rolls. No and no. We already rolled that. So I think we're done with Autumn. So we're moving on to uh, sending this back to the Strategic Warfare. So the European Axis now have their marker back. And the Surface Fleet and the Air Unit are coming back. Surface Fleet goes to the Force Pool. The Air Unit actually has to go somewhere on the map. Might as well put it in Nagasaki, as long as it's within nine hexes of the place that is going to launch the air unit itself. The LBA is going to be within nine. So that's the plan. Um, tragically, tragically effective up here for the Japanese. All right, so next turn, Germans are up. They're going to discard rearmament. In fact, everybody's discarding all of these. Not border disputes, that goes back to hand. And the Germans are revealing military purges, which is boring as can be. No steps, just remove two Ribbentrop cards. Germany already has this plan in motion we talked about in the first video. And to that end, we want to hold on to Lithuania or Czechoslovakia. I think we want to move, hold on to Lithuania. So we're going to discard these two. And that's the end of Germans' military purges. They're not moving anything at the moment, so we're going to head on over to Japan. Now that Japan is at war, and we're on the card-selecting location, let's talk about the actual master plan here for Japan. All right, so here's the master plan, right? We talked a little bit about it before. The master plan includes playing economic expansion as early as possible. Um, in fact, we might play political program instead. We've been thinking about that. We're going to go over that right now. Uh, and then political expansion, and we need Japanese mobilization. Okay, so same thing over here. We're looking at 1938. Japanese mobilization gives two steps a turn. So we want that in summer because Japanese steps are incredibly precious. Anyway, we can get more steps. We're going to take it. Uh, exchanges with China is just going to keep ramping up over time. Meanwhile, we're going to play economic expansion in the spring, because remember, we're in limited war now, so we have access to some more cards. And then we were going to play political program in the fall. There was a reason the quit India marker actually goes to the delay box. So we're thinking instead we might flip this around and do political program here. All right. And then 
we have treaty. And the hope is that this treaty card will give us control over Hope. If we can get Hope without firing a shot, that would be great. They'll join our side. If not, well, we got to try something. And then political expansion comes down here. Political expansion gives us an influence. And that influence can be used to activate anything on the map that has already one Axis influence in it. So what we're hoping for is that the current Japanese card, Diplomatic Overtures, lands on the strategy board once or twice and maybe gets us neutrals pressured. We basically need uh, one in 36 chance. We got two shots at that. If it doesn't, we've got another couple chances here with political program to do what we want. Let's see how that works out. If not, maybe we just use this to get Hope on our side very easily. Uh, so in the meantime, we are now considering our next option. Although I have been considering holding off on political expansion until right after we start Total War, because if we do that, Total War gives us a neutrals pressured for free. And if we can just hold off on playing this until then, we can activate the Dutch East Indies as an ally instead of having to conquer and occupy all of their ports. Um, this is a critical port, Batavia, uh, and 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 you've got other multi-zone ports here that are useful. These are all multi-zone ports that are useful. So is this. They've got an, a green hex that would be under our control if they're our, our ally. They've got multiple of these oil hexes, which we need one of them once oil embargo gets played. So having them as an ally is very nice. We'll have to play it as it lies. In the meantime, we might play that here. And then we'll definitely play continuing mobilization during the next summer because that gives us another two steps a turn and we absolutely need that. So we'll see how that all plays out. Uh, in the meantime, we should draw two new uh, fa uh, Fortune of War cards. So let me pull that up here. And the Fortune of War cards will be Diplomatic Intelligence Coup and Global Raiders. During any political events segment, Roll one card on this table before rolling on another table. You do not roll on the specified card or table. Instead, you may select one result from it. The result must be, ooh, that could be great. We, that increases our chances of getting a neutral's pressure, potentially. Really, really does. Uh, if we can make that work. And then we got global raiders. We can automatically do a successful commerce raid without having to do, um, oh, we get it on both maps. That's kind of cool. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to apply to the Axis here. Commerce rating by them doesn't happen until much later in the game. So that one might be something that we use the, the, the luck uh, to redraw, but I'm not 100% sure on spending it for that purpose. Anyhow, the Japanese strategy is now fit. They're going to declare war on the British in the summer of 1938. This is the moment. You know why? Couple of reasons. Number one, the weather in the spring is clear up here in the central Chinese area. And then the weather in summer immediately, uh, where is it? There we go. The weather in the summer immediately gets mud. So this stops being good fighting weather at the same moment that we would declare war on the British and attempt to take Sarawak and make a, a, a naval strike against the fleet at Singapore. The British have a fleet at Singapore that currently consists of several heavy cruisers and a light carrier, the Eagle. Will they send more ships over there that come off of this track? Maybe. They might send the, uh, the Royal Sovereign over there. Uh, we'll roll a die to see if they decide to do that, only because it actually would kind of make sense. They have so many battleships over here on the European map that it kind of does make sense that they'd start shuffling some things over there. But I don't want to just give myself a free attack because it might not have gone that way. So uh, rather than let myself play everything out, we'll roll a die to see if that becomes a target of the attack. So anyway, bad fighting weather here. 
good fighting weather, we'll try to take Brunei immediately. That gives us a multi-zone port so that we can potentially strike at Singapore shortly thereafter. Uh, Singapore is the multi-zone port that is necessary to get over into the Bay of Bengal or vice versa from the Bay of Bengal into here. So having control of Singapore really helps us with that. And that's the first turn. Grab Brunei. And ideally, we'd also grab Hong Kong. All it has is a single garrison unit in it. All we need is, an, oh, and it's a, uh, and it's a, a um, limited stacking hex. So as a result we would get a plus shift going after that. Even in the mud, it's worth it. And if we can do that, we'll take over a green hex here. We'll take over a multi-zone port here. And then that whole area is going to get shut down for the next turn. Because when we go into the next turn of summer, you can see that all of this area is shut down. If we get our uh, our, our surface fleet back sometime later in the summer, we'll use that to try to land in Rabal or Ley somewhere over there uh, in order to try to start building a force. I'll even put the logistics marker down here to start grabbing and garrisoning all of these ports as best we can. Hold on to Papua New Guinea in an attempt to go after Townsville. All of this is to take advantage of the British when they don't have anything on the map because they will send reinforcements from Europe in the form of maybe Force H, maybe the home fleet, maybe other markers. We'll have to see. So uh, the... The goal here, of course, is to catch them flat-footed. And so far, we haven't done anything to suggest that we're going after the British. So I think it's safe to say that we are catching them flat-footed. But right now, we're in uh, November, December. Uh, is that right? Am I remembering correctly? Yes. So let's keep that correct weather on the board. Uh, and same over there is technically also snow all the time, but that's much easier to tell. If you were interested, uh, the weather in Europe uh, in the wintertime looks like uh, this. Everything is snow except for the desert areas down here. So I don't usually bother showing the weather uh, over in Europe because it's usually very easy to describe. It's either all mud and clear, all snow and clear, or sometimes there's storms down here. So not worth talking about. Let's go back to what's going on here for Japan. Ah, so we've given them the Fortune of War cards. We now have to give the Allies their Fortune of War cards. Uh, da -da -da -da. So they will get Scratch Offensive and Caught at Close Range during any air and naval combat. Interesting. So that could be very valuable to the British if they ever manage to get a, a decent force together to fight. Uh, scratch Offensive gives them two Blitz Markers and it gives them a Beachhead for free. Wow. That, that would be very valuable to them after the Japanese attack, if they have the resources to take advantage of it. So anyway, let's continue with the Japanese turn. They've revealed diplomatic overtures. They are going to play political program, which adds the Quit India marker to the box. I don't think I mentioned that, but the Quit India marker is uh, going to come from right over here. And the Quit India marker represents Japanese incitement of the anti-British Empire movement in India. While the Quit India marker is in the strategic warfare box, the British cannot build any Indian steps. And I don't know if you know this, but the British don't have that many steps to begin with. They have these 111 steps that can't flip over to the other side that have to come from the Europe-Africa box because those are proper British units from the actual uh, island so to speak. And then they have an Indian colonial that can be built in India, and they have an Australian col colonial that can be built in Australia. And they will eventually get some more, but the more that they get are New Zealanders, Indians, Indians, and Australians. And what do they get over here? More Indians. So if we can prevent them from building Indian steps for a little while, that would be beneficial. So the idea here is that the quit India marker comes off of the turn track just at the moment when the Japanese go to war with the British so that the next card they play that try to take advantage and build Indian steps can't do it, can't build the Indian steps because the quit India marker's there. And then they have to spend a card play getting rid of that by arresting Gandhi. And that's 
the way the cookie crumbles, or at least the plan for the way the cookie crumbles. So now for Jap- Japan's actual turn, they've got their cards in a row. Uh, and it, oh, seasonal turn. Germany has no ships. Japan has no ships. Dang. Um, all right. But now Japan has to roll on this table, which is not great. Uh, two to one is a cabinet crisis. <laughs> it couldn't be all roses for Japan forever. So here's the cabinet crisis. It's almost all bad. A three to a two is a border incident, 37.4. All right, so a border incident means we have to go to war with Russia, communist China, or eliminate a Quang Tung step, or remove the army government marker from its holding box. Joke's on you, game, because we don't have an army, we have a navy marker. So uh, I think the result is we have to kill off a Quang Tung step. It's disappointing to say the least, but we will do it. Uh, send a force pool. Don't delete. Jeez, I keep deleting things. Uh, I get close to deleting things anyway. All right. So that wasn't ideal, but it could have been worse. It could have been uh, uh, a get Kokujo. That would be much worse. That is the uh, method of sort of internal dissent of, of, of somewhat culturally approved insubordination, I think is the way that the the rule book described it. But either way, the, the, the Japanese government keeps making it hard for the Japanese player throughout the game, as you can see. So now that Japan has the opportunity, are they going to get Wuhan right away? They're certainly going to try, I think. So now we go through the sequence of play. They do have an air unit. Before we place it, let's determine if we need it. They can get three seven units adjacent to Wuhan, which would give them a six to one, eight to one table. Wuhan would get a shift, bringing it down to four to one, five to one, any result of which would be good. So do we need to spend the air unit here? We have it available. We got it back early. Huh. This is a tough call. Because spending the air unit would bring us up to 6 to 1, 8 to 1. And it will decrease our chances of taking a hit. But I don't think we're going to spend it now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wish that I had it later if I spend it now. So these guys are going to move forward. And then what are these guys going to do? Are they going to combine and move? Oh, before these guys move out, however, we're going to place a detachment in there. Oh, no, the logistics marker. That's what we're going to place. A detachment and a logistics marker. Probably can do that. No, we can't place a logistics marker and a detachment marker. Um, and unfortunately, I think we got to back this guy up before we can place the Quang Tung logistics marker. But we can place the regular logistics marker here in Nanking. And then this guy can move out. And now it acts as a location to, as, a, as the ability to build a naval base, open port, etc. cetera. Like a, like a superpower detachment, really. So we're going to bring this guy in here. That's operational. The troop convoy's been used. Now we're going to decide how we're going to use these guys. Probably we're going to combine them, send this guy back to the force pool and move this guy up uh, just to kind of keep him honest and not give him freedom of movement. And then we're going to probably do the attack. Any other moves to be made here? I don't see any for the moment. So operational movements are concluded. Now we're going to attack with a total of seven to one which gets a shift for the city, brings it down to three to one, and we roll a three DR1. Japan's luck holds. So they are gone. And now we get to enter Wuhan. We enter it with everybody. Yeah, not everybody. I think this guy holds this position up here because they can plop a unit in here and then like zip it down this way. And if they get an allied support resistance, there might be something they could do or Chinese incident. What You never know. So that's pretty good. Then during the uh, reserve movement, we use the convoy one more time. And I bada bing. This guy is going to come. Reserve movement could move this guy up to here. We want to do that. He can zip up the rail line. Might be useful. And then he'll come down to Nanking itself. Uh, yeah. Let's... 
let's stay there. Let's let's keep that. This guy's not going over here to attack this at one to one, one to two, because it's a city, and then he has nowhere to retreat to. No, that's not going to happen. So that's all the reserve movement for Japan. So now we're done, and they gain a extra step during the conditional events segment, which is going to go directly into Nanking. And then that is concluded. So Japan is done. Over to the Western allies who are going to uh, reveal their card. And it's Chamberlain Diplomacy. Excellent. The British are going to pick up one step here. Oh, wrong, wrong things. There it is. Western force pool. They're going to build that right in Southampton. Then they have to pick a card. They had a card planned. It's French rearmament. So that's going to the pending cards. And then they are going to wind up rolling on this table. Before they do that, they roll for the Allies getting naval rolls. That's one for the British and France, no. And U.S., yes. So British and U.S. and then Russian. Russians get it. Okay, Britain, Britain, Russia, Britain, U.S. and Russia. Uh, the British are probably, they've built two battleships already. I think they're going to build a carrier. They're going to build the illustrious. And then the U.S. is... They're going to build one battleship, and then I think I'm just going to have them build nothing but carriers for the next forever. Um, even though their battleships get really good and fast. Look at this. They get battleships that go speed six by the time you get to the Iowa and the New Jersey. And don't get me wrong, they're going to build those eventually. <laughs> I just want to get a bunch of carriers on the dock at first. So, all right. So that's a thing. Now, Russia has to decide what it's going to do vis-a-vis -vis their fleets. Uh, they have in the Baltic Sea two battleships that are pretty slow and weak, and they have one battleship in the Black Sea. So what do they have in... Do they have any fleets? No, they have no fleets over in Vladivostok. Uh, they could, but I think right now they're not going to. They're going to choose to build a pair of cruisers instead for the Baltic. It just if they're going to if they're going to have anything happen, it's probably going to be in the Baltic because they've already got two battleships up there, but they already got rid of the red navy marker, so really this fleet is only to defend against a naval invasion, which I don't think we have to worry about with regards to the Germans, but it is what it is. So, next on the list is the cards. Let's go back to the Russian cards. Um this came back to us. Well, we know that this is going to be their next card, so let's add that to, well, pending after we flip this and move it. This now goes to pending. And now we have to resolve the card. We've already removed the production directorates from the previous card that was played over in the Far East. So now we're rolling a die. Uh, I'm sorry. We skipped over the West because we did the, the naval roll. So it's Chamberlain Diplomacy right now. They've already picked their card. They're rolling on Chamberlain Diplomacy, and they got a four minus one is conflicting plans, no result. And the same thing is going to happen over here. Well, might have a result this time. The quarantine address, as discussed, the uh, aid to China marker is definitely coming. China needs it. They need those extra steps. So that is going to the pending box. And then the allies are going to roll on the quarantine address. They have to remove card Chinese ultimatum, however. Chinese ultimatum, no longer necessary since China, nationalist Chinese is already at war. Uh, where the heck is Chinese ultimatum? There it is. Discard. Done. So now we're going to roll on the quarantine address. It's a five, two, a four, strategy board table. Now on the strategy board table, a six, two, a five. Allies support resistance, baby. That's a good result for the allies. They have a couple of options here. Number one, they could pick up a partisan base marker because pre-war is in fact not an effect over here. That's a strong choice. They could also just kill off that logistics marker that the Axis just placed on the board. That is really calling to me. I would love to do that as the allies, but I think the partisan base, they can only get partisan bases through this specific result. So because we have zero, I'm going to pick up a partisan base here. And getting a second one later is a luxury. It's nice, but they absolutely should have at least one in order to piss off the, <laughs> the axis. So let's do that. Pacific, Western. I don't even know where the partisan bases hide on this marker. Ah, found it. Here it is. 
I'm going to add that to this box here. Uh, we don't need this. That can be deleted. So the allies now have a partisan base. Partisan bases can be placed in any rough hex in a conquered, ac uh, conquered minor uh, allied country. Or they can always be placed in Kiangsu because Kiangsu never gives up. They never consider themselves conquered. So we can place a partisan base hex in the rough terrain over here, for example. And now the partisan base hex acts as an additional reinforcement location. The only time we can't place a partisan base if it is in an enemy Zoc. What that means is, in order to prevent any Kiangsu steps from being built, Japan has to keep a Zoc uh, on 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 hexes, and they have to have control over all the cities 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Oh, yeah, they basically have to have something everywhere over here in order to keep Kiang Su from rising up. It's a huge drain on the a on the Axis resources. Uh, so kind of keeping them bottled up is usually the best that they can do. And now that the Allies have a partisan base, it's going to be that much harder for the Axis to deal with. But it's expected that they get that eventually. So quarantine address is concluded. Uh, I forgot to switch over to the Allies here. And now they've got to move somewhere. It looks like, obviously, they're not going to get into the city here. An attack in any of these directions is uh, 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 absolutely devastating. So they're going to fall back here to the rough hex. They can't cross this. Uh, it, it's not clear from above, but you can see that there is a lake hex here. These are lake hex sides. Um, and so they cannot go right to where they'd like to go, which is over there. But they at least get to a rough hex here that makes it hard for them to be surrounded and killed. And hopefully they can fall back to Changsha and try to hold the last three cities in the south as they build up their units. It will get much faster for them building up units as soon as the Chinese aid marker arrives. And they're theoretically going to get Yunnan and Sichuan in the near future. So, uh, in fact, um, they're going to get Yunnan right now. I forgot to check the top of quarantine address. Select one neutral or friendly minor Chinese country and apply influence. So. Yunnan is now going to activate because it already had one influence on it. So we're going to delete this and we're going to activate Yunnan as a Western country. And we're going to grab the uh, Yunnan markers. This is going to go in the delay box. These get set up on the map. So immediately the allies have some reinforcements thanks to the quarantine address. So what's their best... Oh, this is reserve goes into the force pool. And the rest of these, oh, the, that has to go in Kunming, right? Yes, that has, that's a garrison has to go in Kunming. So these other two get set up in or adjacent to city hexes. So those two places seem as good as any. Now we do a mobilization roll to find out how many of these markers flip over. It's a four, which means both of them flip over. They can't get any more than two. So now these guys can help hold Southern Kiangsu. They cannot stack with the uh, Kiangsu nationalist Chinese, but they can help by moving into their territory and trying to hold it. So that's what they're certainly going to try to do. All right. So that is certainly good for the Chinese. They're starting to get them together. Now, if they can get Sichuan to join, then they'll have a decent force to actually contest the Japanese. Meanwhile, Kansu and the communist Chinese have not gotten their act together yet. They can't quite declare war on the Japanese. So Let's see where we go from here. We go on over to the Russians who have the new five-year plan that we talked about earlier. They're going to roll on that chart. A three to a two is conflicting plans, no result. That seems to almost always be the answer. And then over here, the, Jap the, the, the Russians reveal a border defense card and they reveal another border defense card for next turn because Pact with China is not until the summer and that can maybe get them closer towards war, but not really. Uh, anyway. That is going to be it for the first turn of winter. We do have one unit in the delay box here that needs to be rolled for. That's a three. So it goes one, two, three. It pops up here in spring uh, for the allies. And then we are going to check Europe has nothing. So now we look at the shipyard delay box. We've got some rolls here. I'm going to roll them. Uh, one, two, three, four. 
All right, I have added those there, and we also added the one unit from the November December uh, to the Japanese. So you look at the Japanese fleet display, and you're like, "Wow, that's quite a decent display." They've got a lot of cruisers, they've got a lot of battleships, they've got a carrier and two light carriers. They've got more carriers coming out here. Battleship. They've got two more battleships here. Another carrier over here. They look pretty strong until you open up. The American fleet display, and you look at that one, and you see they have a lot more, and they're going to keep adding more. It's going to get ridiculous here. And that's the turn, so let's go back to the turn track. Here we are. Turn track moves on to the second winter turn. Axis luck, and we get some fleet markers and stuff. So the fleet marker goes into the force pool. The air unit goes on to the map, and it'll put right there. We're still in bad weather here, and what else did we have there? We had the luck marker goes to the strategic warfare box, and that's it for things from this track. And next turn, we'll get these new things coming in the spring. But let's see what happens here. Uh, oh, Germany never put its new card into play, but we know what that was going to be. There we go. So Germany has nothing to do on their turn. So we're going to skip right over uh, Germany and go straight to Japan. Japan still has a roll to make here, which could slow them down if they keep rolling more cabinet crises. A one is a cabinet crisis roll. Uh, they're doing well enough, and we know we're going to need this luck marker later, so we really, really don't want to use it. So we're just going to play it as it lies and see what the cabinet crisis is. A one is get Kokucho. Oh no. Who's in charge? Is it the Navy or the army? Uh, oops, wrong one. Uh, the Navy is in charge, which if I remember correctly means that we're looking for a failure supply. Here we are. So yeah, if limited war is in effect, the Axis has to turn this into a failure. If the Navy, it's failure supply, which means we're not able to move into enemy Zox. So good luck attacking the Nationalist Chinese if we're not immediately next to them here. Uh, so we need a failure marker. Here we are. Failure command. Oh, I guess it flips over, huh? Yeah. So failure command, failure supply. So the Allies obviously would place this in such a way to cover as many... Japanese as possible. They can put it right here and everything within a five hex radius of this failure cannot move into a Zok. So this guy can attack Chengshou on its own at one to one. Um, I mean to roll. Uh, I was trying to pull this up. At one to one, down to a one to two because Chengshou is a city. Yeah, 50% chance that these guys take a hit for no reason. So I think this completely stalls the Japanese attack. They can move for forces around, but they can't move into an enemy Zok. So that is that is unfortunate, but this card has its disadvantages. And sometimes you, you play them because that's the only option you got. So what they're going to do here is they're going to flip this and send this back to the force pool. This guy is going to move up here or down here? I think he's going to move down here. We want to get adjacent to here for the summer, so we need to start moving in that direction. We can't, but we want to. That's, this failure actually really, really limits us, because we will only have two more turns to get down there, and we've got a, we've got a, not a nationalist Chinese in our way, so that's definitely problematic. Okay. And in reserve, could he... Actually, these guys were two one-steppers, weren't they? I take it back. I think instead of combining these guys to help us get down there faster, we'll take the troop convoy down to Fuchao in regular and reserve. That doesn't end a Razak, so it's not illegal. And then next turn, they can move a little bit closer. So that way we'll have at least a four to one against the uh, the British here, and four to one with two shifts is only a two to one. There is a there is a one in six chance we don't take Hong Kong with those numbers. So I'd love to have an extra two stepper uh, coming along to help us out. We'll see if we wind up getting that assistance. But for now, 
Japan can't really do much else. They don't have any attacks this turn because of that failure. So they're just going to take the one replacement step they get from this and put it on the board. And it will be in Nanking. All right. Uh, because that's got a logistics marker. So logistics marker makes it a replacement location. Normally replacements have to get placed in, uh, in, in home areas. All right, so Japan is done. They have Chamberlain diplomacy to roll for over here. They get a two to a one, which is the guarantee table. They roll again. They get another two to a one, which is the conference table. They get another two to a one, which is military aid. Beautiful. That gives them a French step. Very useful for the for the for them to get extra French steps. Uh, they're going to build that one in Paris, and then the British are done. So we go over to the Americans who still have quarantine address to roll on, which could give another failure. The failure, by the way, comes off because it comes off towards the end of the uh, the Axis phase during the what is it the marker segment down here right after combat. Um, but then the quarantine address might just put another one back on and make next turn another nightmare for Japan. And that will really put Japan behind the timetable. They want to attack the British dependent here before the allies get a chance to reinforce it. But with this current trend, a four to a three, there's another cabinet crisis table. And again, a four to a three on the cabinet crisis table is an international incident, 37.19. Well, let's pull that up and find out what it is. All right, so this could get us to war with the British early. We don't want to do that. We don't want them to even know it's coming. Or it could allow the Western faction to perform military aid, or we could remove the Navy government marker from its holding box and put it in the delay box. That's actually kind of appealing. Um, thinking about it now. If we get the Navy out of power now. How will that affect us in the future? This doesn't require us to have the Navy in charge. This doesn't require us to have the Navy in charge. We're not playing Navy program. Honestly, I think we're, I think we're okay. Oh, you know what? Uh, I didn't, I can't, uh, yeah, well, no. Yeah, okay. I was thinking we'd have to give military aid and let them build a Chinese step, but we can actually just throw this into the government, uh, into, into the delay box. Now, we might get screwed by not being able to use that in other situations, but for now, that's okay. It'll work. Could have been much worse for the Japanese there. And that's going to be the end of the Americans. So we go over to the Ger to the Russians. Are the Russians going to roll another no effect? A one? Nope, that's a guarantee table. Might be an effect. A three to a two. Minor country politics. Russia has to pick an area table and roll on it. And then the Germans get to decide if the minor countries do something. So the area tables that are least damaging if the Germans try to make something stir up some trouble, probably Central would actually be okay. I'm thinking the Western table, because the Germans definitely don't want to risk Italy or Spain falling into enemy's hands. I think Spain actually isn't technically a neutral country. It's a civil war country, so it doesn't apply. Um... France is an active, so it's not neutral. Yeah, I think they'd roll on the Western table. Um, and let's see what they get. A four to a three is French Vichy, uh, but minor country politics says if the result is, if it's pre-war or limited war is an effect, if the result is an active Western minor, the Western minor faction must eliminate one step from any Western ground unit within that minor country. So that's not great, but it is what it is. So France will have to kill off that step it just gained from military aid. Sorry, France. All right, well, thank your, 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 your Soviet brethren for that one. Over here on the Soviet north. I don't think we've got anything going on here. So that brings us to the delay box. The only thing in the delay box is the Navy marker. So we're going to roll for that. It's a five. So five is there and we'll put it right here. So they'll get it back at the end of summer, which may give them some more options on cards and may allow them to avoid more international incidents in the future. Are they going to stay on Navy or Army? Probably going to keep them on Navy in the future, but it's not going to affect us quite as much necessarily. Um, unless we want to start placing blitz markers again. Okay, 
So that is the end of that. We have nothing else to roll for over here. So we move the marker forward. We move the marker forward. And I think we're done. We're ready for the next. That one was only an hour long, ladies and gentlemen. We did two seasons in an hour, burning through these. So we're ready to move on to the next one. We'll see you on the next video. Let us know if you have any questions, comments, or you found any other errors that we may have found and put those in the comments below. Thank you.